Hi, I'm Michelle Sikirka. The New Jersey Business and Industry Association is committed to educating the public about the important issues impacting New Jersey's businesses and economy. That's why we're proud to support the important programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Berkeley College, QualCare Inc., a managed care company administering health plans that care about your health care. New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Verizon. And by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. Insurance fraud costs New Jersey families $1,300 a year. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. And by Observer New Jersey Politics. I'm Steve Adubato. It is my pleasure to welcome into our studio Micheline Davis, President-Elect, Executive Women of New Jersey, and also Executive Vice President and Chief Corporate Affairs Officer, R.W.J. Barnabas Health. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Good to see you. We just did a terrific um, panel on Caucus New Jersey with four women uh, leaders in the world of business. Talk about your organization, first of all, the Executive Women um, of New Jersey. What is it? What work or research did they do about this issue of women in New Jersey, excuse me, business, women in business, and why it's so important? Sure thing. Um, Executive Women of New Jersey is the state's premier organization of the very most uh, senior uh, individuals within their corporations across the state of New Jersey, across uh, different siloed industries. So it's so interesting. The research that was done mm -hmm. showed that, um, and by the way, other studies across the nation have shown this as well. There just are not enough women in leadership positions. E easy statement to back up, right? Absolutely. Uh, here's the interesting aspect of it, right? There are not enough women in the C-suites of these corporations across the country and indeed across the world, but there are very many w women in leadership positions. And then more than that, there are a great deal of women who uh, are qualified to occupy the senior level executive leadership position. I say it in that manner, Steve, because I think that oftentimes individuals do not consider certain aspects within the organization as a leadership position mm -hmm. when in fact it indeed is. Um, and one of the things that we found with our executive women of New Jersey seat at the table report is it's a called fact, a seat at the table. A seat at the table, right? By the way, log on, get more information so you can actually read the report. Go ahead. Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we realize is, is the fact that uh, as we begin to measure really very closely just the status of women in the C-suites in these organizations and on boards across the state of New Jersey, we're seeing that the needle has moved very, very little. You know, the other thing is, I know there's a pledge that the executive women in New Jersey have talked about to, to is it to get corporations to commit to greater diversity uh, and gender diversity? Is that what it is? It is both to encourage them and to create some transparency and accountability. The pledge was born out of discussions around a seat at the table when Barry Ostrowski, who indeed is the CEO of RWJ Barnabas Health, who participated in the report, began to, to talk a little bit more about what he could do as a sitting CEO of indeed not just one of the largest uh, health care systems in the state of New Jersey, but mm -hmm. the top 15th in the country. And the pledge says? And the pledge says that, uh, that the men who are currently occupying the seats, that they have to be the ones who are in the room, who as they begin to look around, uh, to discuss the topic, they have to ask the question, do we have everyone in this room who needs to be here on this topic, and why are there no women here? They have to be the ones who literally say, every time there's an opportunity for a particular institutional project or initiative, that they want to ensure that there's a woman candidate who is considered, that for each promotional opportunity, that they do not consider a slate that does not have a woman among them. You know, the other part of this, Micheline, that's fascinating to me, and, and it gets complex, uh, but important to talk about. There's women in leadership positions. There's lack of women in leadership positions. There's research, your study um, showed this at the seat of the table, that corporations do better, as we talked about in our round table with women leaders, like you're one of four, or corporations do better, organizations do better. But women of color versus white women, different issues? 
There are some similarities, but there are also some differences. Uh, one of the interesting things that we sought to do at first when we were talking about uh, taking on the, the challenge of actually producing the report uh, the very first year was whether or not we should also look at both gender and ethnic diversity. Mm. One of the things that we found ethnic was... Ethnic and racial. Ethnic and racial. And one of the things that we found was the fact that the numbers of women in senior leadership positions within these corporations was so slight, that the numbers of women of color was so much smaller, that mm. we wanted to start out and then hopefully be able to have a larger pool to then consider. You know, I talked to you a little bit about this when uh, you were with us in the round table, but I want to delve into this a little bit more. It, it, because you've always been, you've been the first, you've been the only, you've been, and sometimes people think, oh, what an honor, oh my God, isn't that great? Broke the ceiling, she was the first, you were a treasurer in the state of New Jersey. Uh, you held other top positions in the state, uh, top advisors to governors in the past, and hold not one of the highest ranking positions at RWJ Barnum Miss Health. But being the first slash the only in certain cases, play that out for us. It comes not a simple question, I know. It is not a simple question, Steve, um, but one that is worthy nonetheless. Uh, it comes with a great deal of uh, responsibility. I recognize the fact that every single time there was an opportunity where I walked through that threshold, that I brought an entire community with me, a community um, both based on my demographic and a community full of women. I brought with me the future generation of women leaders, and that's a lot of responsibility. Do you really, I mean, it's hard enough to do a good job. <laughs> it's hard enough just to perform in a high-pressured situation with a lot at stake in a certain corporate environment, nonprofit environment, whatever the environment is. But you're saying, I mean, again, we should let folks know because Micheline and I have known each other a long time and she has been so supportive and one of the honorees of our Stand and Deliver Leadership Development Program. She was a Dr. Martin Luther King uh, Leadership Awardee and we, we talked about these things off, offline as well. You're saying that you are very, you have a responsibility not just to do well in your job, but to do what else? Oh. For whom? To do well in my job enough that the next time there, there is an opening, the next time that there is a, an opportunity to fill a seat, that there is the confidence that another individual, another woman should be welcome to the table because this one woman, once she got in, she did so much to bring value to the bottom line. She did so much to add diversity of thought to the discussion around the board table that it's been a welcome change, welcome enough that the door remains open for so many other women to walk through. And you have actively sought out and you have been sought. You've sought to mentor and you have sought to be a mentor. Absolutely. To be mentor, I mean, right? Am I making this? Oh, absolutely. Um, I consider it is what we are called to do, right? The rent that we are to pay for our time on this earth is that of service. And so um, incredibly important to pay it forward. But as we are working in these corporations, in these businesses, at the helm of these nonprofit organizations, the truth of the matter is that we have to prepare both the organization and the next generation of leader. And so, yes, mentor. It's incredibly important. So uh, the pledge is out there. Mm -hmm. Barry Ostrowski talked about it. A year from now, executive women in New Jersey, you are not the president, like you become the president. I uh, become the president uh, next January. Okay. When that time comes, could you actually, I know this is a lot of pressure to put this on you, but you've dealt with it before. <laughs> Can you actually say, this is something substantive I feel that we should have accomplished by that time. Is there something tangible? Is it a numbers game? Is it a, is it a percentage thing? What is it? So January 2017 is right around the corner. Yeah, right? So what do we want to have accomplished by that time? Well, I will tell you this. I will be able to say that we kept the conversation going, that we elevated the momentum, and that as a result of that, not only do we have more women who are, who are swelling our membership role, but quite frankly, we have more companies who are standing up, raising their hand, companies like Investors Bank, companies right. like New Jersey uh, Resources. I mean, ju just an incredible uh, thing for these companies to establish within their their own, right, within our own institutions, initiatives to empower and progress women throughout their ranks. Initiatives in order to ensure that women understand that they aren't just welcome to be employees, they are mm -hmm. welcome to lead. That we will have so many more companies who are lining up on that business honor roll because we have made this the theme of the day. 
And it's interesting, you mentioned those two organizations, the CEOs of those organizations, Bernie Flynn and Larry Downs, yeah. two friends of ours, Great. they are committed to trying to do better. We have a long way to go, don't we? We do, but we've got great partners. Micheline Davis, executive, excuse me, president-elect, executive women of New Jersey, and also executive vice president, and chief corporate affairs officer at a little organization called <laughs> RWJ Barnabas Health. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. We'll be right back right after this. To watch more Caucus New Jersey, find us online and follow us on social media. We are pleased to be joined by Barbara Kaufman, who is Executive Vice President, Newark Business Regional Partnership and Chair, Board Appointments Committee, Executive Women of New Jersey. Good to see you, Barbara. Thank you, Steve. Very I appreciate you uh, staying with us. We actually had a terrific roundtable discussion with uh, four women in leadership positions, you being one of them, talking about the executive women in New Jersey and a study that was done called A Seat at the Table, which concluded a couple of important things. Go. That there are a number of ways that we can improve the speed at which women achieve uh, executive suite positions and also um, access to the boardroom, that it takes a number of different mechanisms to make that possible. So here's the thing, and we were talking about this in the roundtable discussion. Mm -hmm. It also concluded, and uh, you also have known this from your uh, professional experience, that companies that have women, a significant number of women, A, on the board, three or more, you said, on the mm -hmm. board, right. uh, but also in C-suite positions, top-level positions, they perform better. What's the logic or the rationale behind that? There are um, a number of factors. Um, the way that women collaborate, um, the way that they organize the breadth of their thinking, um, that they embrace different perspectives. I think you can take it further, too, though, that the more diverse an organization, um, the better it is to perform well, to be perceived well, and to capture a lot of different philosophies. One of the CEOs that we interviewed for the report, Susan Story with American Water, said that every time that she makes her board or her executive suite more diverse, she encompasses opinions that are different than hers. And that allows her to be able to consider things that she might not otherwise have considered. But what kind of reaction have you gotten? I mean, the study also makes specific recommendations. Uh, Barry Ostrowski, who is the head of RWJ Barnabas mm -hmm. Health, Micheline Davis, who is the president-elect as we speak right now, the organization, she, you know, together with Barry, they, they were very involved in this. Barry spoke. And there was talk about a pledge yes. that corporations were asked to make, which says? Well, um, what Barry did was he stood up and he said, I am taking a pledge that I'm going to make it my responsibility to advance women. And what he meant by that was that he was going to uh, provide role models, that he was going to form groups, that he was going to find positions, identify positions to which women could be considered. Now, this is not a way to be able to create a position for a woman. It's looking simply at the skills and the abilities and saying we want to make sure that when there's an opportunity that women have an equal mm. opportunity to compete. Now Susan Story again, um, to, to quote her, said that women may not necessarily be out at the evening event and they may, they're not, certainly not in the, the locker room, in the men's locker room on the golf course. But women eat breakfast and women eat lunch. And women need to be thinking about how do they take advantage of those networking opportunities. Do women help enough other women? Women, for the most part, really do have each other's backs. Um, but I think it can be so much stronger if we know that part of the team is men, includes men, and also includes women. Because let's face it, right now the men are the ones who are in the power positions. They're the ones who are making more of the decisions. If we just look at the pool of CEOs, women are never going to be able to advance. We have to think about the other skills that women possess and how do we include them. You said something interesting, really many interesting things, but one of them, Barbara, during the roundtable we had with women in leadership positions was that there's a difference between a sponsor and a mentor. Mm -hmm. Try that again. Okay. A sponsor is someone who has your back, who is looking out for you in the sense of they're in a position where they can make things happen for you. So a mentor is somebody who might not even be in your profession, 
who is a good listener, who can give you feedback and say, you know, you might say this differently next time, mm. you might ask for this. But a sponsor is going to say, you know, you're in this position now. If you make a lateral move within the organization to do something that you've never done before, you're going to learn X, Y, and Z skills that are going to position you to be able to move here and then here. And someone who has a road map in mind that can help you to think through how you progress and what the ladder might look like. I'm curious about this as a student of leadership. Should we as men be looking to be sponsors and or mentors of others, but particularly women? I think that's part of what Barry is pledging to do, is to take responsibility for helping women to find that path and to be the sponsor, to have their back, and to lead them, uh, help them to lead mm. themselves along the way. You're hopeful, aren't you? I'm very hopeful. And I, I have to say that doing this work, doing, doing the study, um, one of the things that we didn't talk about before is that EWNJ, um, Executive Women of New Executive Jersey. Executive Women of New Jersey works to help women to identify corporate board positions. And that's an effort that's incredibly important to be able to, for, for the positions that are available. Mm -hmm. But that report talked about a lot more than just being able to identify the positions. It talked about skill sets and broadening the pool. It talked about using recruiters, a number of different mechanisms. So I really urge everyone to go to that website to be able to read the report. Let's put it up one more time as Barbara finishes. And go ahead. That, um, that is a wonderful resource. And to see Executive Women of New Jersey as a resource and something that I believe in fervently is that networking is key to achievement. And for women, we need to know how to build a network, how to grow our network, how to use people, how to use opportunities like this show sure. to be able to talk about the issues. I have a feeling you just helped a lot of people. Barbara Kaufman is uh, not only the executive vice president of a great organization called the NORC Business Regional Partnership, but also chair board appointments committee of Executive Women of New Jersey. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, Steve. We'll be right back after this. Steve Adubato here. It is our pleasure here in our caucus studio to welcome our good friend back. Uh, Bob Carr is the founder of the Give Something Back Foundation. Bob, in just a little bit around this set in four uh, comfortable chairs, one of which you're sitting in, we're going to have four leaders of four uh, institutions of higher learning. Um, St. Peter's uh, University, Montclair State University, the College of New Jersey, New Jersey, and Rowan University. Four institutions that your foundation very much connected to. Explain that connection and how you're helping students who will be going to school there in the fall of 2019. Right. We, uh, we're picking 200 kids, 50 for each of those schools, and we've uh, worked out arrangements with each of those schools to accept 50 of our ninth graders uh, when they become seniors. And so the students that we select, uh, we've selected 78 in New Jersey this spring. And those students will go through their high schools with a college curriculum so that they're ready for college. They have to have a B average. As long as they get a B average and, and, and take the right courses, they're going to go to one of these four universities mm -hmm. and come out in four years with no debt, with, their, with a bachelor's degree. How important is this to you and why did you start this? It, it's everything to me because it's so, such a great way to use time and treasure. To, to change people's lives, change the lives of the families. It's just the most rewarding thing I've ever done. These young people, how are they selected? They're selected by going through a process of completing uh, an application, getting uh, recommendations from teachers, and the, primarily it's the high school counselors that help mm -hmm. drive the students to be active at ninth grade and mm -hmm. uh, basically apply for a college scholarship in ninth grade, which is very unusual. Yeah. But we had lots of applicants this year, and I'm sure we'll have more next year because we've added two more universities in New Jersey. Two more in New Jersey? We have. William Patterson and NJIT. We're very excited about that. Yeah, tell folks real quickly, how does that happen that you select a university? Do they come to you and say, we want to be part of the Give Something Back Foundation? That happens. Plus, also, we have donors who want to put money into their, their alma mater and do, do our program at their alma mater, which is very, very exciting. What do you want for these young people? I, I want these young people to graduate in four years with no debt, and I want them to give back just like they were the recipients of a great gift. The, and, and they do. We, we've been at this for 15 years now, 
and our kids are terrific. They give back, they mentor other kids. It's just very exciting, very rewarding. This is incredible work, and I said this to you the last time we talked. Um, I wish that there are people, and I'm confident there are people watching right now, who may not be able to do the exact thing that you've done, but ask themselves, what can I do? How can I give something back? How could I make a difference? And I'm confident you've done that again. As always, thank you for the work you do. Thank you for supporting the work we're doing, and uh, just keep doing what you're doing. It's all good. We're going to do that. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Steve. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're pleased to welcome uh, Eleanor Ojanaka, who is 2016 scholarship winner, graduate merit, award program from Executive Women of New Jersey. Honor, good to see you. Thank you, Steve. You joined us for a round table uh, talking about women in leadership positions. This award that you got, uh, you received from the Executive Women of New Jersey, what was it exactly? It was a graduate merit award to honor women who were in their graduate education and needed some financial assistance. And, you know, I applied for it and it opened a lot of doors for me and it allowed me to finish my degree at Montclair State. Your master's is in? Chemistry. Beautiful. <laughs> 11th hour you got this. <laughs> Late in the game? Yes. Um, so I got the scholarship in August, right before the semester started in September. And so at that time it was, you know, am I going to have enough money to continue my education or do I have to take some time to work in order to get enough money to finish off? And the scholarship came at the nick of time. I literally, when I opened the letter and saw that I got it, I broke out into a dance. And, you know, I was so happy that I got mm -hmm. it. You're from Nigeria originally. You talked about that in the half hour show we did. And you live in Irvington today. And you're, you're, you just, you were so impressive in the program we did. You, we're, again, you're confident. You talked about your family, gave you confidence and all, all mm -hmm. that. And it was beautiful. But here's my question. As people watch you right now, you win the scholarship. What responsibility do you feel moving forward to make a difference in this world? So the, the responsibility comes from, you know, like I, I mentioned earlier, taking action and being the example. Um, and a lot of my confidence, I mentioned earlier also, comes from my mom. It also comes from my dad. It also comes from my younger siblings. You know, I have a younger sister. She also graduated with her bachelor's in chemistry Beautiful. this year. And it brings me a lot of joy to give her courage. Um, now, I'm responsible to my family. I'm also responsible to my society and my surroundings. And coming from Nigeria and getting the opportunity that a lot of people, a lot of young women from my village in Nigeria don't have, now I have to go back and let them know that it's possible to get an education and to become a leader in society. Do you believe anything's possible? I believe everything is possible. Where'd you get that from? I got it from my parents. Um, my parents, I, I mentioned earlier, they work very, very hard. And regardless of what obstacles are thrown their way, they always make a way. You, you can't tell me no. It's going to happen. Can't. You cannot Someone tell tells you no, what does that mean to you? It means find another way. It means this is an opportunity yeah. to tell them you can say yes. So you can't tell me no. It's just not going to work. I say Pop-Tarts, you say what? <laughs> College education. Well, what, uh, what's the deal with you and Pop-Tarts? <laughs> So when I was in, in high school, my senior year, um, I was my junior year actually, it was time to start applying for college and universities. But this was a tough time for my family because we didn't have the financial resources for me to apply to colleges. Now, college application is like $50 for one, and you want to apply for a lot to expand your, you know, your search. So I began selling Pop-Tarts. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, I began selling Pop-Tarts so that I can raise some money so that I can apply for colleges. And by my senior year, my box of Pop-Tarts became Pop-Tarts and Capricorn juice. So the business expanded and, you know, everyone knew Ella the Pop-Tart girl by senior year. Wow. <laughs> I even had a professor who allowed me to refrigerate my Capricorn juice in his fridge <laughs> so that, you know, during the summer months, customers could be pleased. <laughs> But um, it, it goes to show that hard work can get you far, and it, it's okay to look at other ways 
to, to make what you want happen. We've got a minute left. <laughs> I asked you this when we were together, so I want to make sure if people didn't see that, they hear you right now. Okay. What's your game plan, your dream? So I, I want to make a change, and I don't, I don't have a specific way of doing that just yet, but I want to make a change in the lives of people. I want to make a change in the lives of young girls. I want to inspire people and let them know that it's possible, that no is not an answer that you can accept. So go out there, and if someone says no, you take another way and find another way to make things happen for someone yourself. Someone says, wait, my life's hard. <laughs> you don't understand, you say. Look behind you. Someone's life is harder. Help yourself so that you can help them. It's, it's not easy. I can tell you that much. It's not easy. But when you finish crying, wipe your tears and keep going. <laughs> crying is not a game plan, is crying it? Crying is not the game plan. It's okay to cry, yeah. but you have to keep going afterwards. We're going to keep watching you <laughs> and admiring you. You're going to lead us all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> You're terrific. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Berkeley College, QualCare Inc., New Jersey Sharing Network, Choose New Jersey, Adler Aphasia Center, Verizon, and by the New Jersey Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor, Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. This is absurd. Insurance fraud costs every New Jersey family over $1,300 every year. Report fraud at njinsurancefraud.org.